Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship today here at Ridgecrest. I'm so excited to be joined this morning on the journey, our live stream hosting with my man, James Oney. What's up? James, how you doing today? Man, I'm great, man. How are you? I'm doing good as well. Special day today man. here at Ridgecrest as we call this our Reignite Sunday, where we're starting back our small groups, our connection groups, mm -hmm. and multiple different things. James, what are you most excited about? about starting back connection groups today dude i'm like so excited to see people in the halls just walking talking you know just being relational yeah you know that's that's awesome you know it, ha it gives us an opportunity on a small group level to truly engage one another in different ways and so we're excited for that today we're also excited that you are tuned in and worshiping with us and we're believing that God is going to move and God is going to speak in a mighty way. You know, the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians 3, 3, that the Lord is faithful. Because of his faithfulness, James, we believe and know that he's going to work yeah. in the room that we find ourselves in here at our worship center, but also in the room that you find yourself in today as you worship um, from home or on vacation or wherever you may be. So we're excited and looking forward to what God is going to do and how God's going to speak. Yeah, you know, and our mission here at Ridgecrest is to reach the lost, build the believer, and connect people to the mission and purpose of God. And that's why we're here today. You're exactly right, James. And as we think about that mission, that mission is for us all. And our heart is for our church to fulfill that. And as we speak of our church family today, we want to welcome you to our worship. If you're a part of our Ridgecrest family, thank you so much for being a part of what God is going to do today. And we'd encourage you, if you're our Ridgecrest family, take a quick second, comment in the comment section. Let us know you're there. Let us know who you are, that kind of thing. And then comment back and forth yeah. with one another. We know, James, there's still multiple different situations that may be keeping someone from being here today and allowing each other to comment and encourage one another there's a really way to engage and build each other up even through the live stream and then also if you're a guest of ours today we'd love to hear from you you can comment in the comment section as well or you can text the word guest to 334-384-8080 and we understand as a guest you could be watching a lot of different churches today and it's an honor to have you a part of what God is going to do here today at Ridgecrest and we'd love to hear from you we want to reach out to you we have some free digital resources for you personally or you and your family. So if you're a guest of ours, again, comment or text us. And then again, church family, just comment back and forth with one another and encourage one another this morning in the comment section. You know, another thing they can do, they can share this post on their social media pages. And, uh, and they can share it to others so they can experience what we're experiencing here on campus. You know, James, you mentioned reach, and that's a way for us to reach people right now in the context of our live stream is for you and I sharing the live stream. And we say this a lot, but we may, may never know who might hear the story of Jesus today because you shared the live stream. You know, James, as we think now about what God is going to do specifically during worship today, yeah. We're so excited and believing that God's going to speak and that he's going to move as we worship him through song. And as we speak of worshiping through song, mm -hmm. I know you've had a chance to look at the song list yes. and there was a song that stood out to you that we're going to sing together Absolutely. today. Absolutely. Great are you, Lord. Dude, I woke up to this song. Oh, I that's mean, cool. Dude, it's, it's awesome. Man. Yeah. <laughs> so as you think of that song, it truly is a time to proclaim the goodness of our God oh, and the greatness of who he is and how he gives us the breath. Yeah to yeah. breathe each and every moment. And because of that, he deserves all yeah. praise. Also today, James, our pastor is continuing his series, Myths That Lead to Misbelief. Mm -hmm. This is part eight entitled Wheat and the Weeds. And yeah. so we want to encourage all of you to be ready for God to speak. And you can be ready as you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. We'll be looking at verses 24 through 30 and then 36 through 43. Again, looking at a message entitled Wheat in the Weeds. And this is in our pastor's myths that lead to misbelief series. Yeah, and we want to talk about some other things uh, for a minute happening at RBC, at our church. So you can uh, mark your calendars. Uh, first, we have our RAD. Uh, uh, it's back today at five o'clock yeah. uh, and uh, it's on and off campus and uh, we're just so excited to see uh, what God does through these various platforms that we do have uh, to offer. Yeah, Rad's been so fun, a little different, but really neat yeah. as we've engaged with people in multiple different scenarios and situations and contexts. And you can do that today. James has uh, done a great job in that teaching time and engaging us with that. And so, um, again, the theme is reach, yeah. too, and helping us understand more of what it looks like to reach people. And we've already mentioned this, but if you're just checking
checking uh, the live stream today or just jumping on, just a reminder that today is Reignite Sunday. Our connection groups are back on campus. And James, speak to this for just a quick second. If somebody was looking to become a part of a connection group, or maybe it's been a year now Mm -hmm. and like we're kind of separated and really don't know what's going on, what could they do to get engaged with a connection group? They can actually go to the Welcome Center. Lance, he will be there and he has a list of all the classes and he'll be able to direct and help them to find a class. Yeah, so we'd love for you to do that. Once you feel comfortable being back on campus, to make sure you're a part of a connection group. It truly is one of the main opportunities for us as we think about building one another up to be a part and fulfill that mission. And so those start back today and all across our campus and a safe environment. Love for you to be a part of that. And then also just a quick reminder that RBC3 will be coming up in just a few minutes. And as you experience RBC3 today, we want to encourage you to open your heart and just make note of what God is doing in our church so that you and your family uh, don't miss out on those things. Yeah, lastly, we want to uh, remind you all about checking out all of our social media platforms, uh, our uh, podcast platforms and our YouTube channel. You know, James, as you and I think of all those different things in, in a media sense, even though we're kind of getting back on campus, we can still utilize the media portion of the ministry here at Ridgecrest to reach people. We all know how engaged we are when it comes to media, social media, and things like that. So we want to encourage you all, again, as you check out these social media pages, YouTube channel, podcast platforms, that you can share those things. You can share those to your own timeline, like and subscribe, and things like that so that you can be a part. Uh, or other people can experience what you are a part of here at Ridgecrest. And now, James, we're getting really close to our um, RBC3, and we're really excited for what it's going to communicate today to our church family as we think about what God is doing here in our church in three minutes. Mm -hmm. And then also there'll be a one-minute countdown. So during this time, our heart for you is to watch this video, take some notes, but then prepare your hearts and ask Jesus to speak to you today. Hey Ridgecrest, my name is Tanya Latta and my husband Chris and I are new members here. This is RBC3, three minutes to let you know what's happening in our church and how you can get connected. This fall will be the official launch of Ridgecrest Christian Academy, a new school with a vision to teach character, our true American heritage, and Christian values along with reading, writing, and arithmetic. Ridgecrest Christian Academy will offer first grade classes this fall and registration is now open. To register, just go to rbcdothan.org and you will see a Ridgecrest Christian Academy link at the top of the page. From there, you can read the school vision from Pastor Ray and download a registration form at the bottom of the page. Also, we're looking for motivated, talented teachers. If you have experience teaching first grade and feel God leading you to something new, please send your resume to our CDC director, Melanie Winecoop at mwinecoop at rbcdothan.org. Coming this summer is an opportunity for students to serve our community, worship together, and enjoy spending time with each other. It's called Reach Dothan and it will be held June 21st through the 25th throughout our Ridgecrest campus. Reach Dothan is for 7th through 12th graders and is known to be a time of tremendous spiritual growth in the lives of teenagers. You can register online at rbcdothan.org or by filling out a brochure on campus. The total cost for Reach Dothan is $100 with a $50 deposit due by May 2nd. So go ahead and make plans now. Finally, Ridgecrest, what a special day it was Easter Sunday to see so many of you on campus for worship, many of you for the first time in more than a year. We had more than 1,300 people on campus between our three services in the worship center, our overflow area, and our children and kids areas. Now let's take the next step. Connection groups are back on Sunday mornings, and we want you to be a part of a small group. So if you don't already belong to a small group, now is a great time to get connected. Contact our Minister of Discipleship, James Oney, or come by our Welcome Center on Sunday mornings to find a group. 
So Ridgecrest, register now for first grade classes at the new Ridgecrest Christian Academy coming this fall. Also, don't forget Reach Dothan coming June 21st through the 25th, and the deadline is May 2nd for your $50 deposit. And get connected with a small group to start studying God's Word and spending quality time with our church family. Now you're all caught up. I'm Tanya Latta, and you've been watching RBC3. Good morning, Ridgecrest. How many of you are glad to be here this morning? <laughs> Amen. Let's stand together and we begin our time of worship together.
it is good to see everyone. Let's join together and pray as we continue to worship. Father, you are greatly to be praised. And Father, now we praise your name both corporately and individually, God, and thank you for your goodness. Always, always, always you are good. So, Father, now we ask that you continue to give us the desire to desire you now at this moment with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you would bind the enemy from any distraction, both in our minds and bodies and throughout this campus. Father, we pray the blood of Jesus over every inch. God, may your name be lifted up and greatly worshiped, for you are worthy. And Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated and welcome to Ridgecrest this morning and welcome to all the home folk. And so we do not need to have a run. If I, I normally say if you haven't been here in a while, let us know who you are. But that, that does not apply today. If you are a guest for the first time, uh, all of our Ridgecrest family says thank you for allowing us to be your host today in worship. If you would, would you introduce yourself to us by filling out this little tab called Next Steps on the back of your worship folder. If you did not receive one uh, as you entered in, if you want to just slip up your hand and Rich Crest family, if you see somebody beside you looking for a worship folder, would you slip out and for them and go pick up one in our, right there in the foyer and you can bring it back to them and just uh, fill that information out for us. And would you give that back to us one of two ways? In the offering baskets are located at the back in our foyer as you exit this morning or the best option, our Welcome Center out that door, look to your left, go down the main hallway, it'll be on the right. We have a gift bag for you with some information about who we are as a church family. We would love to see you out there and visit with you just for a second before you go to our connection group. So come see us then. You, had, you heard all the announcements, and I'll be back at the end of the service just to wrap up things. But I'm so thankful for all the talented folks we have at RBC3. And if you see them out and about, introduce yourself to them and say thank you for helping in that ministry and keeping us formed. God bless you. We're Gosh, I'm glad to be here today, Pastor. Uh, and I'm glad you're here too, Pastor. And, and uh, <laughs> I am. We did pray for you last night. I'm excited about the message God's laid on your heart. Brother Tim, Senior Leaders. Yes, amen. I got so excited that first song, my, my glasses even fogged up. <laughs> so much going on. Let's stand together as we continue on with our time of worship and praise. Glorious is thy name, O Lord. Ready? Great praise.
Well, all right. Good morning. I'm glad you're here today, and I'm glad I'm here today, but I won't be here tomorrow. And that's because we have a new grandson, little Cooper. And um, I'll tell you, it's a, I, I was thinking this weekend, what an amazing, uh, it can't be a coincidence, when uh, Bodie, our first grandson, was born, I told you then how smart he was and how, what a brilliant child he was. What are the odds that we would have a second one just as brilliant? <laughs> and uh, uh, so little Cooper was born. In fact, I think I have a wallet picture with, with I, I think, well, maybe just put it up on the screen. I, <laughs> there he is, little Cooper, 8 pounds and 20 inches, born Friday night at uh, almost 11 o'clock. Isn't, that, uh, isn't it crass that the preacher gets to control the screens and you say, why well, can't I put my grandson's picture up there? Well, membership has its privileges, doesn't it? But we're so proud of him. Thank you, guys. You can um, uh, quit harassing the congregation with that. But he is smart. Now, I'm told that he, when, as soon as he was born, he came out asking for his pops. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm told... Uh, before the evening was over last night, he was already reading War and Peace by Tolstoy. <laughs> so he's a smart kid. But anyway, we're so proud. They're doing well. We'll be leaving tomorrow to go to Nashville. She's still in the hospital. We, people have asked, you didn't go? You're not, we, there's nothing we could do by being there. Uh, so we'll be, up, we'll be leaving tomorrow, and we'll be spending the next uh, uh, year there. Uh, <laughs> But at any rate, we are excited, and God was good, and he's healthy, and mama's healthy, and those are the important things uh, about that. Thank you for praying. We had so many of you praying. I mean, our phones were blowing up for two days, and we thank you. It meant so much to us. Let me mention something to you before I get into my message, and that is, in this series, uh, Myths That Lead to Misbelief, back early in the series, I did a message, well, I did uh, several messages on uh, evolution, uh, are we a product of chance? And I had a number of people ask me, so pastors, you, you reference a lot of books and research. Is there, is there a list of those things? Can, have you got a list of those things? And so I compiled a list of some of the resources I used in, in putting together uh, those messages, and uh, we have prepared it. It looks like this. It's at the Welcome Center and if you want uh, one of those, you can just stop by. But some of you had asked for that, so I, I wanted you to know I hadn't forgot you. And um, it's there at the Welcome Center if you would uh, like. Now, you see on your outline this morning what we're going to talk about from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. And I'm going to read the first few verses here in a moment, 24 through 30. And then I want you to keep your Bibles open because we will reference the second passage uh, as explanation. It is Jesus' explanation of a parable and uh, so just so you'll know when we get there. The myth that I want us to look at today on your outline is a loving God would never allow a person to go to hell. How many of you have heard that line before? How many of you have heard something like that? Yeah, probably most of it. In some form or, or fashion, you've heard this, this uh, line. Well, if God is a God of love, why would he send anyone to hell? Now, it sounds so caring, doesn't it? It sounds so appropriate, uh, that kind of uh, logic, but in reality, it is a co-op when somebody a, co- a cop out when somebody says to you, uh, "Well, why would a loving God allow anybody to go to hell?" Well, it is really an attempt to make God the villain and say, "Well, God can't be who He says because He wouldn't allow such a thing." It's a subtle way of saying if God really cares, He'll allow everyone to live their life, live it how they wish, live it and believe what they want, and then He will at the end reward everybody with a wonderful lot. You see, the devil cultivates this myth through the idea that God wants to restrict you. God is a villain. He wants to restrict your freedom, and, and he wants to hold you hostage with eternal consequences. And uh, in other words, it is a myth that is birthed out of the fear of the loss of freedom. God will take our freedom away. And the world defines freedom today as a life without any restraint. I ought to be free to do anything I want to do. I ought to be free to say anything I want to say. I ought to be free to to, to live my life without anybody telling me anything. And we often hear that argued today in this cancel culture that we're living in uh, by people who want to cancel things that they don't like but turn around and say you've got to tolerate things that you don't like. And so it's it's kind of a perverse uh, um, 
dichotomy. The fact is, you are free to choose how you want to live. You really are free to choose how you want to live. In fact, the Bible teaches that. But the Bible also teaches that with every choice that you make, there are consequences. And once you make that choice, you are no longer free, because with the choice comes consequences. The Bible says what you sow, you will reap. Now, God has given you freedom. He's given you freedom. Do your own thing. But He hasn't given you an exemption from the consequences. Hello? Barna Research uh, recently uh, uh, polled Americans on uh, what their thoughts of hell, heaven and hell were. And uh, most of the Americans in the poll, in the survey, do not expe- uh, expect to, uh, to go to hell. Most of them do not expect to to spend their eternity or experience it on any level. Just one half, that is 0.5 of 1% of Americans expect to go to hell upon their death. Uh, Nearly two-thirds of Americans, 64%, said, I'm going to heaven, regardless of their religious background. Uh, One in 20 adults, uh, that's 5%, claim that they will come back uh, as another life form. Uh, And then 5%, Uh, contend that they will simply cease to exist now one of the prime reasons that so many people believe that they will uh, not go to hell has nothing to do with their having a relationship with the lord jesus christ it rather is because so many people in our age have bought into the myth that we're talking about this morning morning and it is that they believe that because god is love it means that they can live however they wish to and god will not Uh, will not impound or impose upon them any kinds of serious consequences now john writes in first john chapter 4 and verse 6 he says we know and we rely on the love that god has for us and then he says god is love the most talked about attribute uh, attribute of god his love is however the most misunderstood i think in many occasions what does it mean when it says god uh, god is love and it's important that we not confuse what it means when when we say god is love for uh, for example it doesn't say love is god it says god is love Uh, and there's a big difference isn't there i mean it's one thing for me to say that um, my dog is a girl it's another thing if i say my girl is a dog want to get you in real trouble right and so we have to understand not to confuse when we say God is love with the idea that love is God they're not the same thing and I've noticed now over the years and I've preached on heaven on many occasions but I've noticed there's very little debate about heaven there's very little debate in our culture about it everybody wants to say I'm going to heaven the vast majority of people uh, accept a, a real and an eternal heaven as the research that I just shared with you uh, supports. They see themselves as going to heaven. And you don't have to persuade people about heaven. A preacher, that's one thing that a preacher doesn't have to persuade people about. Do you you like the idea of heaven? Do you like the idea of going to heaven when you die? You don't have to persuade people uh, about those things. And and so I'm not going to spend the time today in this message on the matter of heaven, though it is clearly referenced by Jesus in the passage that we're going to look at uh, but that's for another uh, message when we might just deal specifically with with heaven today I've entitled the message wheat uh, weeds and wheat or wheat and weeds and it's because this is a parable about that subject and I think when you understand and when we read you'll see why I've named it just that if you're physically able to do so why don't you stand with me this morning we're going to read verses 24 through verse 30 this morning This is what Jesus says. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed uh, weeds among the wheat and went away. And so when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? And he said, no, least in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first 
and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Father, uh, I pray that you'll enlighten our hearts, enlighten our minds. Uh, speak to us this morning from your word. Teach us, instruct us, and Father, I, help, I pray that you'll, you'll uh, show us, Father, if we're weeds or we're wheat. And so we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. Now keep your Bible open. We're going to reference the explanation that Jesus gives for this parable in just a bit. This is commonly, as I've said, referred to as the parable of the weeds. Uh, it focuses on the reality of both the saved and the lost, but it t- points out that they are operating together until the ultimate harvest. That is, they're operating the field as the world. The one who is sowed is Christ. That is the gospel seed. The wheat are those who have responded and received the message of the gospel. The weeds are those who may be religious. They could be counterfeits, but they have, they're still in the field, and it's hard to tell the difference. In fact, scholars tell us that at the early stages of the wheat and the weeds, it was almost imperceptible. You couldn't tell one from the other. And so, uh, so this parable alludes to the counterfeits and to both the weeds and the wheat growing up in the same field, that is the world, together until the harvest time, and then things change at the harvest time. It is, in the end, a parable about eternity and about destination. So I want to show you three things, three truths. There are many truths in this parable. I've preached it before uh, over the years, but there are many things Uh, that we could talk about, but three in particular I want to give you this morning. Number one, I want you to see the nocturnal deception that is practiced. Verse 25, and then you go to verse 38, 39, that give you an explanation of the parables. The good news is that the disciples would say, Jesus, we didn't get it, we didn't understand the message, and Jesus would come back and say, I'm going to explain it to you. And that's what we see in verses 38 and 39. Look at that, if you will, in your Bible. The field is the world, and the good seed is the son uh, of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them, note this, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. He says very clearly uh, in verse 25 that what happened, happened at night. It happened in darkness, uh, the nocturnal hours. The enemy operates in the darkness. Not one of, uh, 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 just one of the ways that he operates, but one among many, but he loves to operate in the darkness. And he, one of the ways that he tries to undermine the work of God, the kingdom of God, the church of God, is by infiltrating the church with counterfeit Christians. Now, I put that down when I was making my notes on this passage, and because there is the allusion to counterfeit uh, uh, being involved in the process. And I, as I thought about that, I thought, really, there's no such thing as a counterfeit Christian, is there? Because if you're a counterfeit, you're not a, a real Christian. And if you're a real Christian, you can't be a counterfeit, right? But the idea expressed here is that there were those who were masquerading that in our, the field and the world that we live in, there are those, and in the church there are those that, uh, that are masquerading, some perhaps intentionally and some uh, uh, maybe not. But there are three things worth noting about this deception. The first is you ought to note when the devil did his work. When did he do his work? Well, it was done in the darkness. It was done in the darkness. Why is that? Well, John answers that question for us in John chapter 3. He says, and this is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. It is the mode of operation of the enemy of our soul, the devil, to operate in the cover of darkness. Now, here's the irony. He, the darkness that he operates in is a part of his masquerading in the light. So he masquerades as an angel of light, but he's doing his work deceptively in the darkness where you can't see it. So that's why a counterfeit can often look right, can often sound right, can often seem right, but behind the scenes, it's just a facade. It's a masquerade. It's a masquerade of the light because, because the darkness is what has captured them. It is the operation of, of the devil himself. 
They never operate. The devil and his counterfeits never operate, do their schemes in the light because they know the light would expose their schemes. And so he masquerades. The second thing you ought to note about this deception is why the devil did his work. Why did the devil do his work? Well, the Tyndall translation of verse 28, I like the way it phrases it. It says, an envious person has done this. An envious person has done this. You see, the devil, here, here's the bottom line. The devil hates God, and he greatly envies God. Isaiah 14, 14 tells us that the devil declared, I will be like the Most High. That's what got it. That was the beginning of the fall and the process of, the, of Satan being kicked out of, of uh, his uh, high position in heaven with his um, demons and the, the horde of them. That's, that's where they were kicked out. And it was all because the devil said, I'm going to be like the Almighty God. I want to be just like him. The devil hates God. He's envious of God. But listen, because he hates God, guess what else? He hates you. Because he hates God, he hates humanity. And consequently, he wants to destroy man. He wants to destroy man's soul in hell. Jesus even said we should fear the one who can destroy our souls in hell. He, and it's all out of spite and envy for God. If, if I can't be like you, I'm going to destroy those you love. I'm going to try to take them down. It's been rightly said, the devil is not all that interested in weed, uh, uh, weed or weeds, but he's interested in worship. The devil wants to be worshipped, and he wants to discredit God, and he wants to totally discredit the kingdom of God. And since the devil cannot get to, directly to God or at God, what he often does is he uh, works against the work of God and against the children of God. And so that's why the devil does what he does. And then uh, third about this deception, you should note how he did his work. He used these counterfeits. Uh, now, he himself is the chief counterfeiter. But the plan of Satan is to imitate the work of God. We see that. We've been talking about in our series on the last days for a year. We've been talking about how uh, one day the Antichrist is a, is a, uh, uh, tries to mimic the power of God, and the power of Christ. Satan wants to imitate the work of God. And to do that, he will use uh, counterfeit teachers. He'll use counterfeit doctrine. He'll use, he'll use religious deception. He'll use religious concepts. He'll use religious people. He'll mingle them among the genuine believers. That's how he works. It's nefarious. Maybe you are familiar with Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad, one of the classics of literature, tells the story about the Trojan horse. You've heard of the Trojan horse, haven't you? According to Homer, the Greeks had besieged Troy for 10 years, for a full decade, with no success. And when their great warrior Achilles was killed, many of them wanted to simply give up the fight. But the king of Ithaca, a man named Odysseus, had a plan. It was a brilliant plan and uh, he said, this will get the Greek army into Troy and give us an advantage. And so Odysseus built an immense wooden horse. And then Odysseus and his warriors climbed up inside the horse. And after leaving the horse at the gates of Troy, the Greek army could be seen sailing off uh, over the horizon. And the Trojans thought, well, the Greeks have finally, after 10 years, they've given up and they've left us this horse as a gift, a peace uh, offering. And so they brought it inside the gates of the city. And then at night, when everybody was at rest and everybody was asleep, at night Odysseus and his warriors, they climbed out of the, uh, the Trojan horse into the city. They began to plunder the city. They set the city on fire. And as uh, the Trojans were sleeping, the Greek ships quietly returned from the horizon and, and uh, the gates had now been opened. They came in and they conquered the Trojans uh, and killed anyone as they tried to flee. Deception by darkness. Nefarious. What looked good was really a death trap. And that's what the devil tries to do in your life. He'll present something that looks real good. He's masquerading as an angel of light it looks real good and he'll bring it to the gates and say here and if you're not careful you 
you'll become a victim of what is behind the darkness of his deeds. The devil is focused, listen, on the long view. And so present deception is what he uses for eternal devastation. But Here's the second thing I want you to see this morning. Not only do I want you to, to see the nocturnal deception that was practiced, I want you to see the infernal destruction that was promised. In verses 30 of the parable, he says, Let both of them grow up together until it's time of the harvest, and then the reapers will go, and they will gather the weeds and bind them in bundles to be burned, and the others to be brought into my barn. And then look at verse 40. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age and verse 42 talks about that place and throw them into the fiery furnace, that place where there will be weeping and gnashing uh, of teeth. The harvest, he says, is at the end of the age. He talks about this infernal destruction. It's promised and it refers to two things. It refers to the return of Christ and it refers to the judgment that follows. And he's talking about several things. He's talking about a future harvest. There's a harvest coming. Sometimes people say this, well, well, it just seems like so much evil is out there and God uh, seems to be so vacant sometimes from the evil that's out there. What's going on? Listen, remember this, God doesn't settle all of His accounts right now. And there's a harvest day coming. Jesus is trying to tell them and teach them that there's a harvest day coming. There's a future harvest. Why does God tolerate the weeds in between here and there? Why does God put up with counterfeit, counterfeit Christianity that masquerades? Why does God allow hypocrites to operate? Listen, is it because he's powerless? Not at all. It's because he's operating by his divine plan. And part of that plan comes to us out of Peter where, where Peter writes and says, God is patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's operating by his divine plan. And, and the reason God allows the weeds uh, amidst the wheat right now is because of timing. There's a time, God's time. And God's timing uh, uh, has a fixed point for a harvest, a harvest of all. In fact, Revelation says it this way, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand, and another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. That means today is very important. What you do today is very important. That means today, if you don't know Christ, if you've been masquerading as a Christian, today is an important day for you because it is a day of salvation. And it's it's important because there is a harvest coming. Because God has not moved at the moment does not mean God is going to move in judgment. You see, the Bible says in Noah's day that uh, people were eating and drinking and marrying and doing all of those sorts of things until the day that Noah went into the ark. It says the same thing about the days of Sodom and Gomorrah before the judgment fell. Why hasn't it fallen yet? God's operating by a divine plan. God's operating on His timeline, not on our timeline. And don't be deceived. Don't believe for an instant that you've got time because you don't know that you have any time. We don't know that we have any time. God knows that there's fixed time for us. And that's why today is important. And I, I beg you, if you're watching by live stream or if you're in this audience and you're not sure that you've ever been saved, don't you leave this place thinking, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Walk out of this place saying, I know that I am. Today is important. Not only is there a future harvest, but I will tell you there's a future separation too. There's a future. All those that have been pretenders will be identified for who they are. Jesus explained that in this same book, Matthew chapter 25, when he said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will look. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, the fact is, we, are, we, we can deceive one another. We, you can deceive me. You can deceive your family. You can deceive your spouse. You can deceive those around you. But you cannot deceive the reaper. 
You cannot deceive God. And, and you may think, that, it, it, watching by live stream or sitting in this audience, that, that well, nobody knows that I'm lost. No, nobody knows that I'm not saved. Because I appear as saved as everybody else. But listen, appearances may fool everybody around you, but appearances do not fool God. Don't convince yourself that you're saved because you're as good as everybody around or you look like everybody around. Don't Listen, that's one of the nefarious, dark deceptions of the devil is to get you to compare yourself to those around you. Some of you may think that you're saved because God just lets you sit here today and doesn't do anything with you or to you. Listen, friend, there is a harvest time coming. There is a judgment coming. And Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And if you go on that passage, he says, and be cast into uh, utter darkness. I, listen, friend, you may have been in church most of your life. It's possible you could be a deacon. You, you might have sung in the choir or sing in the choir. You might play in the band. You might be a small group leader. You've been a fine-looking weed. But if you're a weed, you're still a weed. I had a man in my church in Texas years ago, and uh, he was one of the finest Christian men that I knew. I mean, I just didn't hold anybody in a lot higher uh, uh, esteem than he. And we're in a, a meeting, a revival meeting, and he comes forward and says, I need to be saved. I said, what? He said, I'm not saved. And I was young, and I, I kind of tried to talk him out of it. I thought, I, if this guy's not saved, none of us are saved. I mean, it's a sweet-spirited, exhibited what I thought was the 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 character of christ was a godly businessman on one of the largest drapery manufacturing firms in the world and he said I, i'm not saved and he got saved he called on the lord he got saved uh that night and years later um i didn't by the way there wasn't a lot of difference outwardly because this man looked Looked mighty good on the outside, so, but the difference was on the inside, what Jesus had done in his life. And he would, to, he would always point back to that night that he got saved. And I can tell you that because later, when I went to Florida, we brought him on our staff to serve on our staff. And I would talk to him and I'd say, Gerald, I said, you sure? Yeah, I mean, was that, do you think maybe you were just reaffirming it? And he said, nope, I was lost. I knew all the right things, and I did all the right things. And he said, I wasn't a bad man. He said, I just wasn't saved. And I know that I wasn't saved. That's when I got saved. He pointed to that to the very end. When I went, for, uh, I went to, later to pastor uh, for the first time, I brought he and his wife. They're just sweet people. He's in heaven now. And I brought him down to, to work with our single adults. He's one of the, the sweetest, kindest men I ever knew. I love ministry. But for years, he lived all of that in the flesh. There was no relationship with God. So don't be fooled. There are many who will say in that day, Jesus said, but Lord, Lord, didn't we do this for you and this for you and this for you? And maybe that's you. You've given, you've sacrificed. There's just one problem. You've never been born again. And maybe you think because judgment hasn't come, it will not come. But surely as I stand here before you this morning, it is going to come for all of us. And that leads to the final thing that I want you to see this morning. And that is the eternal destination provided. Did you notice again, verse 30, verse 43, says, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned and gather the wheat into my barn. And, and he reminds us of that again in 42 and throw them in the fiery furnace. He's talking about hell, folks. 
throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is a place of great agony. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. There are two destinations spoken of here. Let me remind you of something today. All of us are going to live for eternity. The question is, where are you going to spend that eternity? All of us are going to live for eternity. Where are you going to spend that eternity? You're going to to either spend that eternity in the kingdom of God or you will spend that eternity in hell. And listen, you don't hear this spoken of too much today. Nobody wants to preach this, but Jesus said it, and it is a place of eternal fire, eternal punishment. And listen, I love you too much to dance around that. And I would not be doing you a service if I didn't tell you that if you've masqueraded as a believer or if you've never trusted Christ as a believer, your destination right now, unless you choose Christ, your destination one day at the judgment uh, uh, is to be cast into the lake of fire with the demons and the devil himself, the Bible says. And it's not something that just gets better over time. So the destinations are you have the option of hell. That's one of them he speaks of right here, where the weeds burn. That's the place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'll never forget, years ago, I went to visit a young man. He was in his 20s, and he was a hellion. And his mom, she was a sweet Christian lady, and she was so concerned and prayed for him so often and talked to him, and he just blew his mom off. And he said, Pastor, would you, ever, would you ever, if you're out that way, would you stop by and see him? And I was on one occasion, and so I stopped by to see the young man. It just so happened that he had two or three of his buddies over at the side. They were out, and uh, they were drinking in the yard, and I pulled up, and I thought, God, this isn't going to work out real good. And I got out of the car, though, and I walked up, and I introduced myself to him, and he kind of made a little snide-looking expression on his face and I said look I I've come here to talk to you about something and that is I I want to talk to you about your relationship with God and he goes yeah my mom sent you out here didn't she I said well she asked me sometime would I stop by and see you but I said that's really beside the point because I'm not here to talk about your mom I'm here to talk about your soul and he said well let me just save you some time he said I'm going to hell. And it doesn't bother me. And his buddies are over there kind of... (laughs) And he said, "I, I don't mind going to hell. In fact, he said, I look forward to going to hell because my friends are going to be there with me. And when we get there, it's going to be one big party. The arrogance. But worse than the arrogance is the stupidity. As if his arrival was going to change hell. And his arrival was, oh, look who made it, finally made it. It's going to be okay now. He's going to install air conditioning. Everything's going to change. Break out every uh, every vice because he's here and we're going to party forever. Friend, that's not how it works. Listen to how it works. The Bible says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, everybody's equal at judgment, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and hell gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, He was thrown into the lake of fire. Now that may not be a popular message today, but it's a message that people need to hear. That's 
how it works. That's how it works. Listen, hell is real. It is no joke. And you cannot change your mind when you arrive. You can't arrive in hell and say, you know what, this is worse than I thought it was. I I didn't believe. I I rejected it. And And so I think I've changed my mind. What do I need to do to get into the kingdom of God? There's no chance and there's no choice. That choice was made when you were here right now. But here's the good news. Hell doesn't have to be, the, it doesn't have to be your final destination. That's just one of two here, isn't it? Because God has provided another option, and that is heaven. Notice he says, where the wheat shines. John Newton, who authored that beloved hymn, Amazing Grace. We all know Amazing Grace. You may not know much about John Newton. You ought to read a biography on John Newton, what God did in his life. He was a part of the slave trade. He he sold humans into slavery, and God saved him. It's an incredible story. But John Newton, who wrote Amazing Grace, said that when we get to heaven, we're going to be amazed. He said we're going to be amazed at three things. Number one, we're going (laughs) to be amazed at who is also there number two we're going to be amazed at who's not there and number three we're going to be amazed that we're there i ask you this morning will you be there have you ever seen signs like proceed with caution swim at your own risk dangerous curve ahead do not enter Keep right, watch for falling rocks. You ever seen signs like that posted along the highway? Why are, they, why, why are they, these signs posted? Why do they put these signs up? They, they are warning signs. They're warnings. They're instruction signs. They are signs to let us know that the wrong choice has consequences that may destroy you. This parable is a warning sign. Jesus is saying there's a harvest coming and there's two options and watch, learn, be instructed so that you don't go down in destruction. I I read about a nightclub named the Gates of Hell and there was a, 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 a newcomer in the city that this nightclub was in and he had heard about it and he wanted to go to that nightclub and so He was trying to find it, and this was back before the days of GPS, and so he saw a police officer. He asked him, he said, I'm looking for the club, the knights, uh, uh, I mean the gates of hell. And the police officer, understanding that there was also a church on the same street as that nightclub called the gates of hell, and he said, said, uh, so the guy said, can you tell me how to get there? He said, sure. He says, you go over here to such and such a street, and he said, then if you'll go past calvary church you'll end up at the gates of hell (laughs) how do you go to hell listen you have to go past calvary you got to blow past the cross of jesus christ that's how you go to hell i said last week god doesn't send people to hell He paid for all of your sins. All of our sins have been paid for. God doesn't send us to hell. We send ourselves to hell by rejecting what He did for us on the cross. And that's like going past Calvary. That's like just walking right past Calvary, just keeping on past Calvary. And listen, friend, if you do, eventually you're going to end up at the gates of hell. I read this this week from an anonymous author. It says, you call me light and see me not. You call me way and walk me not. You call me wise and follow me not. You call me fair and love me not. You call me rich and ask me not. You call me eternal and seek me not. You call me gracious and trust me not. You call me just and and fear me not. If I condemn you, then blame me not. Would you pray with me? 
heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking about. Don't walk past Calvary. If you are not sure, you may be a fine weed, but a weed is a wheat, uh, is a weed and not wheat. And so I want to invite you to do something this morning. If you're not sure that Christ is your Savior, you can change all of that. You can change the destination. And you can do that by calling on Him. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Right now in your heart, live stream, live audience, pray something like this. Lord Jesus, thank You for loving me. I'm not sure I'm wheat. Or I know I'm weed, uh, a weed. I want to change that. I want to change the destination. And so I call on you, just as you've instructed me, I call on you. I invite you to come into my life, forgive me of my sins, and become my Savior. Thank you for loving me and dying for me. I receive you. And I receive the work that you did on my behalf. Some of you in this place and some of you watching by live stream say, I have trusted him, but I've been living a whole lot more like a weed than wheat. And I need to get serious about my relationship with God. Why don't you just tell him that right now in your heart? Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I haven't been walking in fellowship. I've been masquerading. I want to take the mask off. I want to live authentically for you. Now, Lord Jesus, hear these prayers. I know you will. You've promised to do so, and so we thank you for that. Hear these prayers this morning. Those who have called on you to become their Savior, Father, begin that inner work that changes the outer man. They've been living for the outer man. Help them now to begin this new journey of transformation as the Spirit of God now lives inside and begins to shape and change the way they live, the way they think, the way, Father, they operate. We praise you for that. Lord, thank you that we can be here. Thank you for your word that sometimes, Father, cuts across our comfort. But thank you nonetheless so that we never have to guess what you think. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you will, look this way for just a moment before we're gone. Before we're gone to connection groups. Amen? I mean, how cool is that? I want to invite you, if you pray the prayer, to call on Jesus Christ as your Savior. Live stream or in this live audience. Would you do something for us? If you're on live stream, well, you can do it here as well. Text the word pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, to the number 334-384-8080. If you'll text that word pastor to us, we'll know what to do with that. In this live audience, you can use the tear-off panel in the back of your worship folder. Just you know, indicate that today you pray to receive Christ. Give us a little information on the front side. And then if you'll tear that off and drop that in the offering baskets on the way out, we'll take it from there. Maybe you want to join Ridgecrest. You can text the word join to that same number. You'll see it on your screen, that number, just the word join. And we'll, again, we'll take it from there. In this live audience, just uh, check that on the tear-off panel. Drop it in the offering baskets on your way out. And uh, maybe you need to be baptized. You know, any of those words you text to us or you indicate on that tear-off panel, we'll get it. We'll, we'll take it uh, from there. And I hope that you will let us know about your decision, whatever it may be. I'm so glad that you have been here. And um, uh, may the Lord bless you. And uh, be sure, if you don't have a connection group now, you go by the Welcome Center desk, and they will get you connected. All right? I love you. God bless you, Chuck. Hey, everyone. Thank you again for worshiping with us today here at Ridgecrest. And we want to go right back to this moment of invitation. Every time you and I experience God, we have the opportunity to respond to Him. And our heart for us all and our heart for us today is to say yes, to say yes to whatever it is that God's leading you to do and be a, have a heart uh, to be a person of obedience today. And so as you think about saying yes, maybe here's a way that you need to say yes today. And the first is this, to follow Jesus. Maybe today the, 
uh, through our pastor's message, the Holy Spirit has worked in your heart and drawn you to himself and given you a desire to make the decision to follow Christ. If that's you, we'd love to help you with that decision. We'd love to celebrate with you on that decision. So do this for us. Text the word pastor to the number on the screen, 334-384-8080. And we'll have someone that follows up with you to help you know more of what it looks like to follow Christ and be um, to celebrate with you on making that decision. Also today, maybe a way that you need to respond in saying yes is by joining our church. We have the opportunity for you to become a part of the Rich Chris family, and we'd be honored if you feel God leading you to make that decision. If you do this morning, we'd love for you to text the word join to the same number that's already been mentioned, 334-384-8080. And as you text the word join to that number, we'll follow up with you, or you, you personally, or you and your family, and help you know what it looks like to become a part of the Ridgecrest family. Also today, we encourage you, if you were a guest of ours, we'd love to hear from you. Take a quick second, text the word guest to the same number that's already been mentioned. We'll follow up with you with some free digital resources and let you know more about our church. Then lastly, maybe a way that you feel God calling you to say yes to him is through serving. We'd love for you, if you feel God leading you to make that decision, to text the word SERVE to 334-384-8080. And as you text the word SERVE to that number, we'll give, uh, there'll be a list for you to follow up with and click through and let us know the areas of your interest. And then the staff member that oversees that area will uh, follow up with you and help you know more about how you can get plugged in and connected to serving in that place. You know, as we think of this as well and responding and saying yes to whatever it is God's leading you to do today, maybe you'd rather email us. And you can email us at decision at rbcdothan.org. As you send that email, just in the body of the email, let us know what decision God is calling you to, and we'll follow up with you through an email as well. You know, it was a special day of worship today, and just across the board, it's a special day for our church as we reignite different ministries and different contexts of things that we once did, and now we have the opportunity to do those again. And so we look forward to what God is going to do. Thankful for how God spoke to us today through our time of worship and just that special time where Brother Tim led us and the team. And then this message from our pastor as we think about the reality of this myth and and fighting it to make sure we're focusing in on the truth of who God is and the hope that's in Him and Him alone. And so I encourage you to let this message, let this time of worship be something that propels you this week to continue to seek after the Lord and use your life for his glory. As we wrap our time up together today, just a few reminders again. Today was Reignite Sunday. Our connection groups are about to start in just a few minutes. And as you come back on campus in the days ahead, or you're back from vacation or something like that, we'd love for you to connect in a connection group, a small group Bible study that will be able to engage you with the scripture and encourage you with just being the church, a fellowship, and a heart of loving one another. And so we'd love for you to connect with us as we begin back small groups in that context. Also, just a reminder that RAD will be back this afternoon at 5 o'clock on all of our platforms. Check that out. And then RBC3. RBC3 is a video that uh, played earlier in our service. And as you think about RBC3, we encourage you to check it out on social media this week as you and I can watch that on Monday and share that and be reminded of what the three minutes uh, of the different things that are going on in our church. And then lastly, make sure you check us out on social media, our podcast platforms, and then our YouTube channel. Our heart is to create engaging content to encourage and equip you throughout your week to continue to focus on the Lord and follow Him. So again, thank you so much for worshiping with us today here at Ridgecrest. We're so excited for what God is doing in our church, so excited for what God is doing in your life. And we want to encourage us all as we wrap up to remember our mission. We don't say it just to say it. We say it with a heart to fulfill it and be obedient to it. May God use us this week to reach the lost, build the believer, and connect the people of God to the mission and purpose of God. Thank you all for worshiping with us today. We love you guys.